Welcome to my channel. Today, I want to look at how to determine if a system of linear equations has a solution or infinitely many solutions or no solution. Now, for us to do this, the following steps are very important to us. If you are given any system of linear equations and we are asked to tell whether it has a unique solution, this means it has one solution or has infinitely many solutions or has no solution. What is important to us first is to extract the augmented matrix from the given system. And then reduce that augmented matrix to echelon form. And then with that echelon form of that augmented matrix, you look at the last row, and the last row will give us a lot of information about the nature of solution to the system. So the last row will tell us whether that system has one solution or whether it has infinitely many solutions or has no solution. So it's the last row of the echelon matrix that will be giving us a lot of information. Let's look at an example just to make this clear for us. So the first example is this, and we are told, we are given these augmented matrices. These were extracted from some systems and then reduced to echelon form. So I, was, I had systems of linear equations, and then I extracted augmented matrices and reduced them to echelon form. So the first, for the first system, this is the echelon form of the augmented matrix extracted. And this is for the second system. This is for the third system. And this is for the fourth system. So each of those systems, I produced the, their augmented matrices to echelon form. Now, we've said that it's the last row that will tell us the nature of solutions to that system. You realize that the last row in matrix A is different from the last row of matrix B. And it's also different from the last row of matrix C. And it's different from the last row of matrix D. And therefore, that means that each of these last rows has something to say about the nature of solutions to the, their respective systems. Let's begin with the augmented matrix A, which is, of course, in its echelon form. Supposing that my variables were x1, x2, and x3, then let me extract the equations here. So the equations would be 2x1 plus 4x2 plus x3 is equal to 16. And this would be x1, x2. So 2x2 <coughs> plus 3x3 is equal to 12. And this will be x1, x2, x3. So that is x3 is equal to 2. So what is the nature of solution? I can see that this x3, I can get x3 to be 2. So that means I can solve this system going up. So once I have x3 as 2, I go to this equation here and find the value of x2. And then proceed with the first equation and find the value of x1. So in fact, this system has one solution because I can get the value of x1, just one by x3, one value for x3, one value for x2, and one value for x1. <clears throat> so this system has one solution. It has a unique 
solution or one solution. So let's uh, see what I, I said about the system for this matrix A. I said that for matrix A, the last row tells that the original system has a unique solution. In other words, has one solution. In fact, just as I've, said, I've done before, we can extract the equations, and this is what we have. And so when I solve, <clears throat> from the bottom, I have that x3 is 2. And so going up to this equation, we can make x to the subject and substitute x3. So that is x2 equals to 12 minus 3 x3, but x3 is 2. So that means x2, 2x2 two two will be equal to 6, or x2 is 3. So now we go to the first equation and find the value of x1. And when you substitute now in this first equation, the value for x2 and x3 and makes x1 the subject, I found that x1 would be 1. And so, as I've already stated, you can see that this system has one solution. We have one solution for x3, one solution for x2, and one value for x1. And therefore, what is the solution to this system? The solution for, to this system is this. So we write the solution in vector form. You can write it as a column or as in row form. So x1 was 1, x2 was 3, and x3 was 2. This is the only solution to this system. So this system has one solution. So let's again look at how the echelon form of the augmented matrix was. <laughs> this was the echelon form. And I can see there was one value here, one value here for x3, and then the answer was there. So that means this system has one solution. Let's go to the second system and see whether it has a solution one solution or several solutions, that is infinitely many solutions, or whether it has no solution. Look at the last, the last row. And so we looked at this again earlier in our first video, when we were looking at Gaussian elimination and goes to Jordan elimination. And we say that if the last row appears is this, so that we have 0, 0, 0, 0 up equals to 0, and then we would identify the leading entries and then the free, the leading variables, and then the free variables, and solve the leading variables in terms of the free variables. And we would also equate the free variables to some parameters. And that will mean that this system has infinitely many solutions. So let's just look at what are the solutions to this system. But once it is 0, 0, 0, 0 is equal to 0, and then it means it has infinitely many solutions. So let's have a look. So I extracted equations from that system for matrix B. And this is what I got, x1 plus 7x2 plus x3 plus 3x4 equals 13. Then the second equation was 3x3 plus 4x4 is equals to 9. And then the other one was 0, 0 plus 0 plus 0 is equals to 0. So this is a leading variable. This is another leading variable. 
So X1 and X3 are leading variables. X1 and X3 are leading variables. X2 is not leading and X4 is also not leading. So these are free variables. So I've said and said uh, here the leading variables are X1 and X3, while X2 and X4 are free variables. So we solve for the leading variables of these non-zero equations in terms of the free variables, in terms of the free variables. So that means Beginning with this last equation, make this the subject. Make x3 the subject. Beginning with that. So when you begin with that, you would find that 3x3 would be equal to 9 minus 4x4. Dividing both sides by 3, you have x3 is equals to 3 minus 4 out of 3, x4. So I've solved the least leading variable in terms of the free variable. And that's what I have here. That's what I have here. That x3 equals to 3 minus 4 out of 3, x4. And then, after solving that first leading variable, we go to the first equation and solve for this other leading variable in terms of the free variables. So this is what I have. X1 equals, so this other cross the equal sign, I would have 13 minus 7x2 minus x3 minus 3x4. But I know what x3 is. This is x3. So I substitute it there. So I have 13 minus 7x2 minus, this is our x3, then minus x4. Simplifying this gives us this. So I have x1 equals 10 minus 7x2 minus 5 out of 3, x4. And then after that, we would equate the free variables to some parameters. So I say we now equate the free variables to parameters. For instance, let x2 be t and x4 be s, where s are real numbers, s and t, where s and t are real numbers. So that is where now we get the infinitely many solutions. It comes from there because one may say that t is one or two or three or four. So we have no limit for the choices. Another person would say, let's S be one, two, three, four. Another one chooses another one, other, other values. So supposing I have t as one and S as one. I would have one set of solutions. Another person would take T to be two and S be seven. That will again will give us another solution, another different solution. Another one still will take T to be negative 10. Another one S to be a thousand. So you see, we are not, we are not limited in our choices. So we, have, we can have as many solutions as possible. And that is why we say that this kind of system where we have zero, 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 zero equals to zero in the last row has infinitely many solutions. Has infinitely many solutions. So this is my solution, the general solution to that system. I got x1 to be this, and I also had gotten x3 to be that. 
this one, this value here, this is x3, this is x1. And then after saying that x2 is t and x4 is s, I can now write a general solution to that system. x1 is this, x2 is t, x3 is this, and x4 is s. This is the general solution. And as I said, that now depends on what value of t you want. You can take t to be two. Another person can take t to be five. Another one can take t to be negative 10. And s, you also be choosing on your own. Choose the s you want. You may want to choose s to be one. Another one may want to choose s to be two. So you see that once you choose, okay, this is, this x4, our x4 is s, our x4 is s, so this one is supposed to be s, not x4, because we've already changed it. So then we will have infinitely many solutions. We would have infinitely many solutions depending on uh, the choices you make for s, t, s and t. Okay, that's good. Let's look at um, the other example. The other example was C. And for C, look at what we have. Look at what we have in the last row. We have zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is equals to five. And that is not possible. We cannot have zero plus zero plus zero plus zero equal to an unzero number. So that tells us that that system of linear equations has no solution. That system has no solution. The original system has no solution. That is for C. That's what I've written here that I say that for matrix C, the last row tells us that the original system has no solution. In fact, we would have 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 plus 0x4 plus 0x5, it's equals to 5. And you see the left hand side will give us a total of 0. And the right hand side is giving us 5. That is not possible. We cannot have 0 equals to 5. And therefore, that system has no solution. That is one example. And that is an example of a system that has no solution. After, you can see that after reducing the system to a form, we were able to tell that the original system had no solution. Let's look at the last matrix. In the last matrix, this is what we have. The last row is this. One, so suppose this is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. We have x4 plus x5 is equals to one. So this system is the same as this. The system for matrix B is the same as the system for matrix B. That the two have infinitely many solutions. Because in this case, just like in the case of B, we would solve the leading variables in terms of the free variables. So the free variables would be x3 and x5. But x1, x2, and x4 are leading variables. So we'll solve them in terms of these others. So let's just extract the equations and see how to get a solution to this system, the infinitely many solutions to this system. And that's why I, I noted here that just like in the case of second matrix, the matrix D has its original system of equations 
having infinitely many solutions. We have these equations, x1 plus 2x2 minus x3 plus 3x4 minus 2x5 is equal to 2. And this other one, this is now, after reducing to echelon form, this is what we get. And so the free variables are x1, x2, and x4. And those are the leading variables. The leading variables are x1, x2, and x4. But the free ones are x2, x3, and x5. No, x2 is not, is not free, it's a leading variable. So the one that is not appearing in the leading variables is x3 and x5. So as we said earlier, we would equate the free variables to parameters. So let x3 be t and x5 be s, where s and t are real numbers. And then solve this system beginning from the bottom going up. So make x for the subject. So when you make x for the subject, you find that x5, no, x4 equal to one minus x5, but x5 is s, so it'll be one minus s. So that's the value for x4, one minus s, and that's what I have here. I have already inserted the values of x5 and x3. x3 is t and x5 is s. So I'm left to, I want to get x2 and I come to this equation, make x2 the subject. So x2, x2 is zero minus 2x3 plus x5. x5, we know what it is. x3, we also know what it is. x3 is, is t. So this is negative 2t plus s. That is our x2. And then we proceed this other equation and find x1. So x1 will be, we take all these others to the right side. So it will be x1 equals to 2 minus 2x2 two two plus x3 minus 3x4 plus 2x5. Then just substitute the values of x2, x3, x4, and x5 since you already have them. And you will find that x1 will equal to 5x, 5t plus 3s minus 1. So clearly, you can see that that is the original system had infinitely or has infinitely many solutions because the values of t and s would depend on what you want. You may want to make t to be 1 and s to be 1 or t to be 2 and s to be one, or t to be three, s to be five, and so on. So it's you choosing from the real numbers. You're choosing those values from the real numbers. So that means you would have infinitely many solutions as depending on the choices you make for s and t. So we looked at those examples and we've seen if that when a system is given to us and we are asked to tell whether it has a solution or infinitely many solutions or no solution, we can do that by first of all extracting the augmented matrix out of it and then reducing that augmented matrix to the form and then look at the last row to, that to tell what kind of solution we have for that particular system. Let's look at another example. Look at this example. It says, consider the following system of equations. So this is a system given to us. <clears throat> and the question is, for what values of beta does the system have? Roman one, infinitely many solutions. 
in Roman 2, no solution. So that is, the question wants you to tell us what beta will be so that this system would have many solutions. And what beta will be so that this system would have no solution. So the first thing we do, as we have, we've already said, we extract the augmented matrix from this, reduce it to echelon form, and see what beta will be for us to have infinite many solutions and or to have no solution. So I did that, I extracted, I, I reduced the echelon form without extracting the augmented matrix. I just reduced the system to echelon form which is possible. So this is a system given to us. I'm reducing it to echelon form. I have this leading variable here, and I want it to be the only leading, the only variable, then zero variable in the first column. So I want to make this position to be zero, and this one is already zero, that is okay. So I just want to make this one to be zero. So to make that zero, I say that this is supposed to be row two. Row two, the new row two will be equal to row two, the new row two is supposed to be equal to row two minus two row one. So I interchange this. Supposed to be the new row two is supposed to be row two minus two row one. I want a zero in this position. So two x minus two x. Two x minus two times this gives me zero. And then this is already zero. So I have zero minus two one by negative y, and that will be positive two y. And then I come to this position, z minus two, negative three z. And this is six z plus z, which is 7z. And then here, 2 minus 2 divided by 5, that would be negative 8. And the other row remains where it is. Is this. So the next thing is now to use this leading variable, this leading entry here, to make this one to be 0. And that is achieved by taking, this is supposed to be, I interchange these things, this is supposed to be the new row three, is supposed to be row three minus row, row two. The new row three is supposed to be the current row three minus row two. So when we do that, this subtracting this from this gives us zero. Subtracting this from this gives us another zero. And subtracting this from this gives us beta plus eight. So reduce that system to echelon form. This we get. So this is where we begin reasoning from here now. The question is, what can happen? What, what should we do to this last row? So that the system has infinitely many solutions. And what we discovered from our previous exam, that for this system to have infinitely many solutions, we have several options. And the first option that I am seeing here is that this is supposed to be zero, and this is also supposed to be zero. So that we have zero equals to zero. So whenever we have zero equals to zero, like we had in our augmented matrix A in our previous example, then the system would have infinitely many solutions. So what 
what we should do now for us to get it bitter, we should just equate this part to zero. Because this is already zero. So we also need to equate this to zero. So I said, I said, looking at the last row, where we have this, this part should be zero equals to zero so that the system has infinitely many solutions. And therefore, we set beta plus h to zero. And doing that gives us beta as negative eight. And so if beta is negative eight, the system that we are given would have infinitely many solutions. And the question is, the second question was, what should be bitter so that this system has no solution? What should be bitter? And you remember that in our previous example, for the system to lack solutions, we had a zero, a zero in this, on the left side of the last row, and then an zero number on the last on the on the right side. Nine zero number on the right side. So if this remains to be nine zero, the value on the right side, if it remains to be nine zero, then the system would lack solutions. So what would be the value of beta? For this to be nine zero. You see, when when should be when can this be zero? This can be zero, this value can be zero when beta is negative eight. When beta is negative eight. But when beta is something different from negative eight, the value here will be non-zero. So that's what I said as my solution. My solution I say that for a system to have no solution, this part should be zero equals to n, where n is non-zero. And therefore, we equate beta plus eight to not equal to zero. And this will imply that beta should not be equal to negative eight. So the system would have no solution if beta is not equal to negative eight. But if beta is equal to negative eight, we will say that this system would have infinitely many solutions. So that means if beta is one, the solution, the system would have no solution. If beta is negative seven, the system would have no solution. If beta is any number other than negative eight, the system would have no solution. So that is the answer. Let's look at the last example here. The last example says, consider the following system of equations, and this is the system of equations. And we have several questions here. The first question is, find the value of beta for the above system of equations if it has to have no solution. If this system has to have no solution, what would be beta b? What about if this system would, would have only one solution? or a unique solution, what would be the value of beta? What if, if it were to have infinitely many solutions? So just as I said earlier, the first thing to do here is to reduce this system to echelon form. Reduce that system to echelon form. This is the system. I use the different form. I want this to be the leading entry and to be the only and zero entry in the column. So I multiply this. I want to make this one zero. To make this one zero means I have to multiply the first row by beta and subtract from the second row. So that is why I say that the second row would now become the previous second row minus beta R1. So x times beta will be x will be beta x subtract from beta x I have a zero I have a zero here and then for this one I have four y minus one of this one by beta I get a beta square 
y. And this is what I have here after factorizing y. This is what I have 4 minus beta square y. Then I also come to this other side. I have 2 minus, multiply this one by beta, I have beta. So this is what I have 2 minus beta. Now, so the question is, you see, this is now our echelon form of the original matrix. This is the echelon form of the original matrix. Look at the last row. And from the last row, we will get solutions. We'll get um, answers to our questions. The first question was, what should be beta? if the system would, was to have no solution. Now, if this system is to have no solution, remember that this part should be zero. And this part should be non-zero. And that is what we do. So we equate this part to zero and equate this part to not non-zero. So we will say that let this be not equal to zero, and let this one be equal to zero. And so we will choose a common solution for the, we solve the two separately and choose common solution. So using this part, I've said using this part, this last row, if this system has to have no solution, we must have this left side equal to zero. So if the left side is equal to zero, and this right side must be equal, to, must not be equal to zero. This right part must not be equal to zero. So we solve these two parts and come up with a common value. So let's solve the left side. You notice that the left side will be four equals to beta square or beta will be equal to plus or minus two. And that's what I have. Beta will be equal to plus or minus two. So for us to get a zero in this position, beta is supposed to have to be two or minus two. Then we have this other condition that this part should not be equal to zero. So that's what we, we go to now. Using this part, which is not equal to zero, and making it beta the subject, we find that beta is not equal to two. Beta should not be equal to two. Because if beta is equal to two, then this part will be zero. But we want it not to be zero. And so we are left with one condition. Remember that here we had beta, beta was equal to two, and the beta was equal to negative two. And this other condition has given us that beta should not be equal to two. So that means you're only left with this. You're only left with that. So thus, if the system is to have no solution, then beta should be equal to negative two. Because that is the only thing you're left with. And that is clear. Now, the B, B was, what should be better if the system is to have exactly one solution or a unique solution? And it continues and says that if there is exactly one solution, find that solution. So we go back to this echelon form of our original system and look at the last row. If this system was to have one solution, then what we have there is okay, so that we have this part equals this part. So this part here should not be equal to zero, and this part also should not be equal to zero. This part should not be equal to zero, and this part should not be equal to zero. 
So if that happens, then this system would have one solution. That's what I said, that using this last part, if this system has to have one solution, then the left side should not be equal to zero. And I solved that, I solved that. So I can factorize this. If you want, you can factorize. If you don't want, you can leave it how it is. When you just say that, that means that beta square is not equal to four, beta square is not equal to four, or beta should not be equal to plus or minus two. And so that's what I say. This implies that beta should not be, should not be equal to, should not be equal to two, and it should not be equal to minus two. Beta should not be equal to plus two, and it should not be equal to minus two. Now, what about the, the right side? The right side should not be equal to zero. So again, I go for that. I go for that. That two minus beta should not be equal to zero. That means that beta should be equal to two. And so that's why I say that for this system to have a unique solution, we would have beta not equal to plus or minus two. Beta should not be equal to plus or minus two. Because if beta is plus two, then this part will be zero. And once this part is zero, it means we've gone, the system will not be having one solution. Remember that if this part is zero and this is not zero, then this system has no solution. And if this part is zero and this is zero, then the system has infinitely many solutions. So we just need this part to be not equal to zero. I think that is what we should go for, not even this. We should go for this part. It should not be equal to zero. Of course, this can be zero. This one can be zero and this one not equal to, to zero and the system will still have one, one unique solution. So let's, for us, for the system to have one solution, let's just look at the left side. Let's just look at the left side, that the left side should not be equal to zero. And that gives us this. That gives us that, that's enough. What was, so the question was, that if the system has one unique solution, what is that unique solution? Find the unique solution. So we want to proceed and find the unique solution. So to find the unique solution for this given system, you just solve from the bottom going up. We have the echelon form. We have this echelon form. So just find, Just to find the value of y here. To find the value of y here, we would have y equals to two minus beta over four minus beta square. Of course, we know that this is two minus beta out of four minus two times four plus two. No, it's not true, this is beta. 4 minus beta plus 4 minus beta. 4 minus beta times 4 plus beta. So that this cancels. This cancels. And y becomes 1 out of... What is this? This is supposed to be 2. This is supposed to be 2. This is supposed to be 2. So something else. Making y the subject here, y equals to 2 minus beta out of 
4 minus beta square. And this is the same as 2 minus beta out of 2 minus beta modulated by 2 plus beta. So this part that cancels, and you are left with y being equal to 1 out of 2 plus beta. So that's the value of 1. You proceed with this second equation and make x the subject, substitute y to find x. Let me see what I did, what I got when I did that. So we found y to be this. Now solve for x and make x in the subject would have x equals to one minus beta y, but this is our y. And so that gives us x to be equal to two out of two plus beta. So what is the solution to this system? The solution to this system, as you say, we can write it in column form as a vector in column form, and the value of x is this, and the value of y is this. So this is the unique solution to that system. Let's go to part C. What was part C? Part C wanted us to find beta so that the system has infinitely many solutions. Find beta so that the system has infinitely many solutions. So we go back to our echelon form and look at the last row. For this system to have infinitely many solutions, then this look at this last row. This part is supposed to be zero, equal to zero, and this part is also supposed to be equal to zero. And then we choose a common solution. So equate this to zero and equate this to zero and choose a common solution. A common value for that, for, for, for out of those two results. Choose a common value. So let's just see what I did. So I say that using this last row here, if the system has to have infinitely many solutions, and then this left side must be equal to zero and the right side must also be equal to zero. So when we, left, we solve the left side, four minus beta square equals to zero, we would get that we would have two minus beta equals to zero and two plus beta equals to zero, or we would have that beta would be equal to plus or minus two when you solve the left side for beta. And when you solve the right side for beta, this part, it means that beta will be equal to two. Beta will be equal to two. So the left side has given us two values and the right side has given us one value, but we choose the common value. So the common value is that beta should be equal to two. And that's how we tell if a system has infinitely many solutions or has one unique solution or has no solution. So those are, that's the, those are the steps and you can look at various examples to enhance your security.